First of all, Judas has already betrayed Jesus. He's got silver in his pocket, and he is sitting at the table with Jesus, really aware that he is about to betray this guy, looks him in the eye and says, it's not gonna be me, I'm not that guy, because Jesus says, one of you will betray me tonight. Imagine the nerve of sitting with Jesus and lying to his face, being justified in how you feel, the bitterness that he must have been carrying to pull that off. He leaves early, not exactly a sign of innocence, uh, and that is followed by the, what we experience as now, now as communion. So Jesus takes the, water, the, the wine and the bread and he lays it out as the significance of his body and his blood. And we know because in 1 Corinthians when Paul says, and on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup, that this is all happening at the same time. Okay, it's a busy 24 hours. This is also the meal where Jesus says, you know, you're, you're all going to kind of abandon me at some point, and Peter, bless him, is like, not me. I'm with you to the end. I'll die for you. You and I are in this together. And then Jesus says three times, you'll deny me. Before the rooster crows, before the start of the next day, you will deny me three times. Which for Peter, who is known for being arrogant and sure of himself, is like, <laughs> Jesus is wrong which is something we all know happened regularly. Um, that's a lie, that's not true, I was kidding. So after dinner, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, and there's this repetitive moment where Jesus tells the disciples to stay awake and be vigilant so that he can go and pray, because he knows stuff is gonna go down and he needs to be prepared, and they keep falling asleep. And he goes into this moment with God, with his Father, and he begs for an opportunity to be released from this responsibility but he will also be obedient and do what God says. And so he goes and prepares himself for death. He returns to his disciples who are sleeping again and Judas comes and betrays him with a kiss. And everybody freaks out. Peter slices the ear off of somebody. Jesus heals it. Everyone is in like pandemonium. The disciples run away and Jesus is taken in the middle of the night to the Sanhedrin, to Caiaphas who is the high priest. False prophets, um, false prophets, pro false testimonies are put against him. People say he did things he didn't do. And through the whole trial, Jesus remains silent. Until eventually, Caiaphas gets so frustrated at Jesus not defending himself that he says, I adjure you by the living God, please just, just say something about these claims. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? This is Caiaphas's moment for Jesus to say, no, I'm just kidding, to let him off. But Jesus doesn't. He says, as you say. He says, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. This is not good, okay? For anybody that is not the Son of God, this is literally the worst thing that you could say at the Sanhedrin. And again, everyone freaks out. And in the meantime, Peter is sitting outside the temple gates trying to hear what's going on. And three times people ask him if he's that guy that they saw with Jesus that one time. And three times he says no. And I can imagine that when those rooster crowed, he must have felt such a deep sense of remorse, of guilt and shame, as he realized he had fulfilled the exact thing that Jesus had said to him hours before. So then things get a bit political. We go from the Sanhedrin, again, in the middle of the night, through to um, Pilate, who's the Roman governor. Now, Pilate doesn't actually wanna get involved in Jewish issues. He's like, as far as Rome is concerned, this guy's just maybe crazy, so we don't really wanna try, try him with anything, so take him to Herod. Herod's the king of the Jews. Herod can deal with it. Herod is more political than he is religious, so he's not upset about the blaspheme. He just doesn't like the idea of another king. But he still is like, technically, has he done anything? No. So he sends him back to Pilate because he doesn't want to get involved. Probably because it's like 4 a.m. You know? <laughs> this is not stuff that should be happening during Passover. 
So Jesus is sent back to Pilate, and by this point, Pilate has been plagued with dreams where it's possible that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, and as a Roman, to grapple with the gods, not a good thing. So he's not keen to get involved, and he thinks, I'm gonna make this a trial of the people. You're all here, you're obviously agitated. I'm gonna give you a really obvious choice. You could free Jesus, who has done nothing, or you could free Barabbas, the known killer. Which one do you want to free today? guys, but they choose Barabbas. They free Barabbas. And so Pilate washes his hands of the situation. He says, this guy's blood is not on my hands. This is over to you. And so the guards take Jesus and he is beaten. He is forced to carry a cross and he is crucified on Golgotha that day. It's a crazy 24 hours. And if you're in it, it's bleak. It's disappointing. It's the wrong thing to happen. This guy was supposed to be our savior and he's dead. If you're living in the moment, everything feels like it's all gone horribly wrong. But we live on the other side of that day. I don't wanna spoil next week for you, but this story gets really good. I'm just saying, I'd keep an eye on it if I were you. Now, there are so many things that we could take from this narrative, and, and I think that we take for granted the gravity of this day because we know the outcome. But actually, I believe there are lessons for each of us within the day before Jesus died that we need to pay almost as much attention to as we pay to the day after. So we're gonna take the last few minutes to look at a couple of people in this narrative and how they were impacted by this day. We're gonna start with Judas the conspirator. You can find the end of his story in Matthew 27, verse one to 10. After he had betrayed Jesus, he felt a deep sense of remorse. In fact, so much so that he went to the religious leaders that he had conspired with and said, I, I regret it, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been involved, I shouldn't have done this, take the money back, please, uh, forgive me for this. And their response is complete dismissal. If you enjoyed this video today, why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.